Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Your hosts today are me, I'm Jason. And I'm Travis, regular co hosts. We connect with all sorts of different people, TOs, uh, competitive players, and just um, anyone else that has something interesting to say that they message us and convince us to talk about on an episode. Yeah, we do like making the world a little bit smaller, one hobbyist at a time. We do have a Discord and a Patreon, which is definitely some stuff that you should check out if you enjoy our content. And if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to share it with your friends who play Kill Team, because the more the merrier. Hello, hello, listeners. We just wanted to give a small Patreon shout out to our most recent subscriber, Lucas M. Thanks, Lucas. Yeah, and thank you all of our sustaining Patreon listeners who help us do our little weekly stat show, which we have been uploading to YouTube starting as of last week. So if anyone wants to catch what our Patreon content is like, check us out on our YouTube on Just Another Kill Team podcast on YouTube. In this week's episode, we chat with Tyler from the Pacific Northwest, chatting about the the scene up there, as well as deep diving into novitiates. Here's the episode. Well, we're here to talk about the Seattle scene, and I think a little bit about you know what we've what you've been uh, competing with, and some of the other stuff that's coming up in the Seattle group in the next coming months. Because we just had Tacoma, which was a pretty mm-hmm. fun event. Can't really talk too much yeah. about my experience as a TO, but how was your experience as a player at, I think, the largest GW Kill Team event to date? I think it was just the largest GW like event in North America to date. Yeah, that so, might be true, too. Um, it was crazy huge there. Um, like, such growth from, like, the two years ago when they had the Seattle Open in Tacoma. Um, no, but it was awesome. You did a great job, by the way. Um, knocked it out of the park, especially... Um, for just being the only only TO. So congratulations on that, man. Um, and as a player, it was awesome. Um, you know, my my hate for Into the Dark, uh, my, you know, infamous hate <laughs> for it definitely hurt me. Um, I hadn't, you know, like, like usual, I hadn't prepared it because I hate it. Um, and there was a few times I made mistakes on that and that. That knocked me down to a little bit lower than I would have liked to personally finish, but I'm still happy with how I did. Uh, all the people that beat me are incredible players, so I'm not mad about that at all. Yeah, so real quick recap, how did you, what did you play and, and what was your record? Uh, so I played Novitiate. Um, I decided the night before. Um, I, you know, I wasn't really sure if I was going to be playing because there was some other stuff potentially going on. Um, but yeah, so I got there. And I bought my ticket, and I still hadn't decided. Um, I had Legionaries and Nemesis Claw with me, because it's just one big happy family for me. And then also my Novitiates. And I was trying to decide who I I wanted to play. Um, I really hadn't practiced a whole lot with Nemesis Claw, uh, so I didn't really feel comfortable with them. And I have quite a... I have a lot of reps in with Novis. Um... Well, they've been shelved for a minute other than LVO, um, I'm still capable with them. You know, they feel good. They feel good into the, the current meta. Um, overall, I went four and three, um, which is solid. Um, I lost to Zeke uh, from Kel Team uh, with his Nemesis Claw on Into the Dark, which um, that's a rough matchup, period, um, especially on the mission that we had and the map. Um, and then Brandon Bean uh, whooped on me with Blooded. That's like a, a classic grudge match up here in the Northwest. Um, I always love playing Brandon. We really only ever play each other at like events like this. Um, so that's great. Always a fun time. And then um, finally, Kellen um, beat me with his scouts. And uh, that's, you know, amazing player. Scouts are strong. They're such a stat check. Um, I made a few mistakes and he punished me for them. Was that when? When did you play Kellen? Uh, at the end, the last round. Yeah, Kellen yeah. on Scouts is definitely not to be trifled with, and Scouts you probably are a pretty hard matchup for Novitiates right now, just because your weapons aren't don't trade that favorably into them. And once you go out and you take your shot, the Scouts can definitely just just tap you out of existence between shotguns and melee profiles. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, like I had a, a couple, like I mispositioned my. Uh, one of my pergottises and he took a shot really early on. Oh, my cats are fighting. Sorry. Um, but the, he took a shot early on and 
didn't quite kill her. Um, and that hurt me because I had to invest faith into to healing her back up. And then my condemner was set up to take a, a return shot and just whiffed. He did nothing. Mm. You know, and even the with condemner, the relentless ploy, huh? Yeah. Um, you know, it was just like not good. He like rolled ones and twos back into ones and twos. It's definitely a heartbreaker. Yeah, I think I got like a hit on on the first shot, and that just kind of like um, snowballed. Because if I could have maybe like taken someone out, um, maybe made some early plays, it would have gone a little bit different. Um, yeah, but overall, like uh, I don't think there was much I could have done in that matchup. They just have the were movement you, and stuff. Were you guys on in the dark or on open? On into the dark. I played so much into the dark. Every time I go to one of these events. I get like anytime there's like board selection, it's into the dark for me. The power of random chance just punishing you for your famous hatred of in the dark. Absolutely. I mean, like, it's got to be like Zinch. Like, he's like, he's like, this is, this is perfect here. Even if you don't believe in into the dark, into the dark believes in you. It does. Yeah. You know, I like, maybe I'm like starting to kind of like it, like a little bit. Like, I don't totally hate it. I don't like There's it, but I definitely don't totally some hate positives it. to having it in the overall mix of the boards. I think as long as your open boards are open enough where melee teams don't just automatically have safe places tied, then the confines of in the dark provide a nice contrast to the experience of open where it's more obvious where you're going to get shot at, but melee teams do a little bit better on in the dark. Yeah. Yeah, and there's some nice little metagame tricks on in the dark specifically around like door play and just positional things that people don't think about, which can be kind of fun. Yeah, yeah, you know, like one of the the things that I got to pull off, which is always fun, is like running up to a door and then while you're on conceal and then opening it and then hatchway fighting. Um, you know, catching people with that's always always a gas for me. You know. There's stuff like that. There's uh, being able to break a guard shot in a way that your opponent isn't expecting, or even just making sure that people know that guard is not as good as it sounds like on paper. It sounds great. But, you know, novitiates do have one big trick on in the dark, which I believe someone that I was talking to at the tournament didn't realize at the time, where when you do Defenders of the Faith, which is your big strategic ploy phase where you can take a free fight or a free shoot, you can go on guard. Yep. Yep. Or that, you can hatchway always... fight if somehow that was possible, which I don't think it is because there's no novitiate model that can be on an objective and touching a door frame. So luckily yeah. that's out of the picture. I mean, that would be amazing. When I so like when I originally did my novitiates, I put them like because mine are all kit bash. They're like super kit bash. So none of them have the original bases. I like basically threw away the novitiate box and I put the sister superior on the 32 and I was like, Oh, they're all on 32s. And so I built them with that. And then I had to rebase them, which was a disappointment, you know? Yeah. As far as the rest of the Seattle scene, you know, you were on here two years ago talking about novitiates, I think yeah. last year yeah. when we started doing this, we were talking about novitiates and the scene in Seattle has grown kind of like leaps and bounds. I think the very first Seattle tournament, there were 16 people at the tournament. Yeah, 19 maybe, I think. Yeah, and then the next year was 60, and this year we're all the way up to 90 people in the tournament with, I think, 80 people making it all the way through day two. Yep. Yeah, it was really good. Um, it's always so great to see the community come out for events like this. Um, the energy was so high. Um, here, you know, like seeing all the people come from out of town to um, Canada made a good showing. We had someone from, I think, Alaska, um, you know, and then all the people that came up from California and Nevada and stuff like that. It was super awesome. And then obviously you from New York coming out to, to TO for us. Super great. Yeah, it's a yeah, solid and show. like, you know, this was the first this was the first big Age of Sigmar tournament. So GW had big shoes to fill compared to the previous year. And I think overall, it seemed like people really had a great time. And we had yeah. some of the big meta menaces of the last couple months rear their ugly heads with Mandrakes and Brood Brothers and then Commandos taking first, second and third. How was the rest yeah. of the Seattle scene kind of feeling about the trials and tribulations of the last couple of months, especially with a lot of people not getting a lot of in the dark practice? Um, you know, like... I think that people are like pretty happy with the meta, obviously, like there are teams that are strong. There are always teams that are strong, but a lot of us still remember, you know, Colt summer, Felgore summer. Um, and like, 
it's still so much better than that. It's not like going up against Mandrakes is an auto loss unless you're playing like Adrian, um, you know, like then you can pretty much count that you're going to lose, um, you know, Brood Brothers against Baki. That's going to be a bad time for you. But like playing your average person, um, even like a, a skilled person, it's not necessarily like a loss. Um, the skill levels like increase so much that I think that. Uh, people are able to to play and kind of express their skill through different teams now. Um, we used to have like a really like elite heavy meta up here, especially last year around this time, and that's like basically gone. Um, we still have like a lot of elite players. I mean, everywhere does. You know, Legionary still showing up to tournaments. Nemesis Claw, Intercession, not not so much these days, but like they still make a a presence every once in a while, and so like. Yeah, people are just playing like a lot of different things. Um, Cody did really, really good with his Star Striders. Um, Chuck did great with his. Uh, he was playing Colt all or the Brood Brothers. Uh, Connor obviously killed it with his Admech. Go Admech! So yeah, I mean there was even a Phobos player that tied Chris on the first on his first round of gameplay which yeah. actually caused Chris to get second place. So while elites might not be as dominant as they were last year, this time in Tacoma, they still present a real threat in the meta. And Seattle had a lot of Warp Coven players, which is an interesting fact of the meta, the local meta. Yeah, I mean, like, we, we have, like, a couple devoted Warp Coven players out here. Um, they just love the team. They just think it's fun and flavorful. And I support them uh, playing that. Um, I think they're a little bit, like, masochistic for it. But I love them, you know? Yeah. It turns out that Warp Coven is still pretty hard. You got to do a lot of things right. And it's very easy to make mistakes with them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think that they're like in a better spot, but I just um, I don't I don't think that they're ever going to be that team in this edition. Yeah, I think probably one of the bigger surprises making it as the top cut in day two was actually Corsair Void Scars. So Chad, one of the other Pacific Northwest figureheads, it sounds like from my time there in Seattle, he did pretty well getting into the top bracket with Corsair Void Scars and really getting very close losses, it sounded like, in day two. Yeah, um, I, I think Chad's just like killing it. Um, I, I actually, this was the first time I got to meet him. Um, I've talked to him a lot online, uh, obviously, like I do everyone up here, it feels like. And um, I didn't know that he was taking Corsairs and he just knocked it out of the park. Um, really consistent gameplay, uh, really, really precise gameplay, uh, which is something that I think like the Seattle area is really really known for we have quite a few players like that that come out of that area that are um very into that like ultra precision you know yeah i mean being precise at a high level of kill team when things can really come down to literal millimeters and things getting missed is super important so being really precise definitely there are positives to that and then when we get to other teams that were really big this weekend at Tacoma. Uh, Jimmy played Wormblade pretty well. He was in contention for the top slot, only losing to Adrian after Adrian clawed his way back from, I think, a 1-4 four, four, round 1 or round 2. So Adrian was clawing back some pretty big deltas, basically on the backs of keeping the chooser of flesh alive and then swinging back for later turns. I mean, that seems to make sense. Like, when you look at, like, kind of winning uh, point distribution, it's the, it's the late game points that, like, really matter um, on stuff. It's, like, getting total tack ops towards the end, um, making sure that you're finishing stuff. But, yeah, that, that's where it really counts. Um, you know, scoring early. You don't want to miss out on, like, the, the stuff that you need to get early on. But um, it's, like beating your opponent in those later stages to really, really win. Yeah, and it really sounded like that was generally a trend um, for successful Mandrake plays in general. Yeah, and then the big counterplay against Mandrakes for anyone who's been struggling against Mandrakes is if you have a chance to kill the Chooser before he does something, make sure to do it because the Chooser Flash is literally the entire team for the Mandrakes. If he gets a kill or, God forbid, gets one or two, gets two kills, you're really going to struggle at the end game when Mandrakes can teleport willy-nilly and just avoid your operatives. 
Because I know that a lot of players get to rounds three and rounds four, and wherever your operators are, you are kind of set in the objectives they can really touch. And Mandrakes really are not if they can get to three APL. Yeah, they, they get kind of nutty. Their movement and and everything like that just makes them, you know, kind of next level at the moment. Um, I think that it's really hard to underestimate the value of mobility in a game like this. To be fair, you know, I think they were the most taken team at Tacoma this weekend with 10 players taking them. Only one player converted into the top eight, and that player was Adrian. So for as good as they are, they still require excellent piloting and being able to foresee which operatives are going to be the most important. One tool for people trying to make it with Mandrix is hitting that smoke with your Shade Weaver and using it as a safe teleport location. That seemed to be a pretty big part of the Mandrake gameplay that I saw this weekend as I was TOing. Yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting. I had actually never thought about using that um, for that, but it really gives them like a lot of range and control over where they're going. Yeah, it gives you safe spots for you to be able to teleport into. Meanwhile, you know, we had Brood Brothers as the other Meta Menace. They got second place this weekend with Chris. Obviously, Brood Brothers are a big part of the meta right now. Do you feel like they are going to be like this crazy big Meta Menace? Or are there plenty of matchups where they run into issues? Obviously, the last couple of weeks have seen Hunter Clade and a couple of the other wider teams. Blooded did pretty well this weekend. Wormblade, another example of these wider teams. Do you feel like Brood Brothers are definitely a step over do you feel like teams like blooded brood brother or Wormblade, novitiates hunter clay and some of these other kind of finesse wider teams still can play against brood brothers and hang out with them after um, your experiences this weekend you know i didn't get to watch too many of the brood brothers matchups i do think that they have some weaknesses um worm blades like one of them that sticks out to me um hunter clay they make sense you know that that's going to be kind of a counterplay. Uh, but I still think that they're, they're enough of a menace that we need to kind of consider them um, in any gameplay, like any major tournament at this point. Uh, I think that they're in contention for top table, um, period. You get a good pilot behind them, and they're, they're going to be difficult to take out. Yeah. The Brood Brothers definitely have big weaknesses, or some weaknesses, probably not big weaknesses, and depending on how your opponent pilots and which operatives they take, you can kind of change your game pl gameplay plan around them. It was really funny this weekend watching Chris basically take the Patriarch all the time, but as the Patriarch needs, it's like taking Grandpa out on a walk as far as Kill Team goes. You gotta keep him with a babysitter. I think Chris was talking about how he was using the Patriarch with the Veteran, so the Veteran can do the free jump in front of an attack, a melee or shooting attack, and then keeping the medic nearby whenever possible, try to bait people into spending way too many resources on the Patriarch, kind of like taking Grandpa out on a walk, which was a pretty funny mental image of an old brood lord Patriarch just being taken out by, for a walk by his little kids. I mean, like, we need to get, like, the old Patriarch, like, that's, like, seated, like, really fat and decrepit if you're gonna do it in that style, you know? Like, go all in. <laughs> Yeah, it was just a, a fun cane. mental image, and I was like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just take an old grandpa out for a walk, because uh, you gotta make sure that that Patriarch does all the work, and if he has a bodyguard, he is going to slap basically anything straight out of the playing field. Yeah, I mean, like, he's gonna eat any and everything he comes across. Like, is there anything that can beat a Patriarch in melee? Definitely not over two rounds of melee. Like a Custodes, maybe? With a shield? Oh! Well they have enough crits where you know it's, it's going to be rough no matter what 21 wounds means that it's generally not going to be in the first round of combat and if you have to go through two rounds of combat with it no one is coming out without anything happening to it so really you want to chip it down with some shooting and that's where the veteran guard medic babysitters definitely do run into some issues for opponents because now you have to basically send in five sets of resources or just run away from it and go kill the, the dorks on the side mm-hmm Definitely. I mean, like, do killing the dorks is always a good thing to do. Like, you know, Geller Pox. What do you do? You kill all the little little bugs and stuff. You know, smash all the dorks and then, uh, then deal with the big guys. Yeah, like, in general, like, the meat and potatoes of Brood Brothers, although, it, you know, they have all their cool flashy tricks and their big models and the Patriarch centerpiece and all that, there is just a bunch of goons that just buckle and die like the guardsmen they are. 
And that's definitely a good thing to think about, a good thing to focus when you're trying to dismantle them. 100%. Just seven wound models, no real tricks, like novitiates or anything. You know, it's not like you're going to be like, oh, actually, I'm going to make this save here. It's going to go exactly as I need it to. None of that's happening with the, the Brood Brothers guys. Yeah, the closest assembly that the Brood Brothers have is that they can make you shoot someone random rather than blinding aura. But at any rate, if you know that that's what's going to happen, you just bake it into your overall game plan and don't ever try to just take one shot against the Patriarch. Make sure you're trying to angle multiple shots or just going for the guys on the back line. But this weekend, when you were playing Novitiates, did you have you spotted anything in the newer meta that you think novitiates need to look out for or things that you wish you had thought about at the time that you could have done better i mean like you know the, there was definitely like some times into scouts um where i could have like positioned a little bit better um you know i forgot about like some of their their little tricky tricks that they do um you got to be aware of that like they're they're a stat check team but like they're also they're just like good at what they do they have a lot of like the stuff that they need to achieve the game um state that they want and like make the forward progress um nemesis claw is kind of difficult like they they can die pretty fast um but if you're not if you're not lined up like you need to be on into the dark um they can definitely like push you pretty hard and take that win um so like really look at where you're you're placing people and placing those resources because you really only have like a couple guys they can kill with novitiates, you know, and once those people are gone, you have a bunch of people that are basic guardsmen with auto guns. And that's, that's super rough, you know? Yeah. When looking at your power pieces on novitiates, you've really got the four big ones. You've got the two flamers, which are okay <sighs> against 10 wound and down, but not great against 12 wound and up because the three, four or the two, three break points are just not great. Mm hmm. And then exactly. you have your leader with the plasma rifle or pistol, depending on whether or not you're going to spend CP for Eyes of the Emperor. And then you've got the crack grenade wielding eviscerator who can basically chop anyone else, chop anyone up, but is only going to do it one time. And then the crack grenade is going to get four hits on someone. And hopefully that's enough to kill an opponent, right? Right. Exactly. Um, you know, like it, it can be rough. Like the condemner is pretty sweet sometimes. You know, when he's hot, he's super hot. Um, you know, I know I shot a, one of the choosers of flesh and scored four crits, you know, removed it from the board immediately. Um, and that, that was great. That felt amazing. Um, but like, if you don't get those crits and you don't get what you need, um, it's gonna, it's gonna feel rough. Definitely a little bit less reliable than some other pieces on the team, though. Just because four dice on threes, two, three mortal wounds, two P1 is just kind of a swinging profile. Yep, exactly. Like, the damage isn't quite enough um, if you don't get enough crits or if they block one of your crits so you're not getting the, the five wounds from the crits in, from the mortal wounds and the, the actual damage. Um, it can be hard to overcome those those barriers and get into the, the higher wound models, 10 and up, there. Yeah, there's definitely some, some parts where the team will tend to suffer, and that's really against the 10 wound, 10 wide teams, right? Commandos were always historically kind of a rough matchup. They've been tuned down, but their strengths still actually line up fairly well against Novitiates, which is always rough. Yep. Absolutely. Um, I was talking with Zach, who's another prominent Novitiate player out here um, after this weekend, and uh, we both kind of came to the same conclusion that, like, there's just moments where novitiates are they're like really good they're really fun um they're very thematic but they just kind of fall flat um like there's not you don't have enough power pieces to achieve what you need against teams who can bring the damage with every single model like scouts like felgor like commandos um nemesis claw stuff like that like if you can if you can get initiative and you can make some early plays definitely winnable like totally you know good dice but like missing a roll um or just having them like pick you off um early on it can definitely like it feels very um like a, a down slope fast yeah were you able to find any tools that were able to help you kind of stall the game out because i think one thing that we i saw this weekend and i've kind of seen across the board is that 
extremely good players find ways to kind of drag games out to give yourself more openings to find ways to win. One of the ways I was describing Kill Team more recently is that the problem space in Kill Team either expands or collapses very quickly based on what the dice probabilities show you. Because you can play on the matchup, you can play on the board, and you can play on the stats, or you play on the dice. And generally, what is good or right can use those first three things, but the dice basically are the last thing that give you more room to play. And Novitiates, because they have such reliable dice, because you can fix your way through some of the problems and caster can kind of to the same extent you can change those probabilities and just focus on that other stuff so were there things during the tournament where you wish you had been able to kind of drag things out to let your opponent's dice fail a little bit more or was it really these stat check moments where the shotgun comes up your novitiate dies no matter what you do and you there's just no way around that yeah it's really those stat check moments they got me you know like um i think all of the teams that i, I ran into it was you know Nemesis Claw, um, stat check, like, I couldn't couldn't push enough damage through. Um, blooded, they had more bodies. Like, even though I'm killing them, um, you know, they, they just have more bodies to do more actions. And then scouts, just every one of their, their guys can, you know, a bolter is super deadly to a novitiate. Um, you know, a shotgun is super deadly. One of their knives is deadly to anything. Um, you know, like, they're, they're killing you every time. Um, so you just like you don't have enough models that can put out the damage to do it and then like they make a couple saves you miss a dice and it just kind of leans in their favor yeah this is definitely a spot where i've seen people kind of run into these sorts of gameplay experiences and i feel like there's probably room to let people take scoring opportunities and then punishing those scoring opportunities and playing for later later turns like i know that many people talk about going for an even 3-3 split and then just adjusting for the later turns but if you're going to go into a matchup where you're almost guaranteed to lose on the pure stats you're gonna have to give up something and i think positional play is probably a spot that you have to look into giving a little bit of leeway for i know jason kind of did this at lvo when he took assault intercessors and just gave up on his home points and just ran at his opponent because really if you think about it Space Marines are never going to win on the activation count, but they can win on the I can use my activations to kill more models as part of the game. Yep. Mm-hmm. Hey, absolutely. Um, I think that so like I tried to to kind of hold back against Brandon with his blooded because I was like, OK, I force him to come into me. I, you know, I kind of just wait um, and I can hopefully get a couple kills together, force him to group up. He's got a lot of activations. Space is pretty tight. Um, and he just he just hung back. Um, he just outweighed me, you know. Um, and like I said, he could feed the bodies through to keep the pressure on and then make those kills that he needed to. Um, I think scouts would have kind of been the same way if I would have held back. Um, eventually, he's going to kind of burst through the room. He's going to make that breach and he's going to have to because you can only dedicate so many people in a lane on Into the Dark. Um, I can't really like shift. Um, quite as well on open i'd probably have a better time um especially with my experience on it uh but on into the dark i i really think that it was hard for me to hold like hold back any farther than i was um i think i played pretty conservatively i didn't really push into my enemy's territory unless i felt um i had a good operative to do it and uh opportunity but like when they they're just throwing a body at you and you can't quite kill it and then you're dead once they arrive it's it's hard yeah that does make sense i think the seven wounds definitely is one of those issues against scouts because you really can't catch catch a scout charging your lines right right exactly you know like um if like defenders of the faith goes off as you want it to and stuff like that um that's pretty good (laughs) but it's still just two, three damage generally, unless you're boosting it because you know, you're going to get that, that later flame or kill with it or make use of it after that. Yeah. So when it comes to tack ops for novitiates, uh, first of all, what archetypes do they have? I feel like I've mostly seen recon. Do you play recon? Excuse me. I, I played security almost all weekend. Oh, that's uh, a mostly that's fun twist. That's, that's, that's what I was comfortable with. Um, but also like some of the maps lent themselves to it. Um, Recon could have worked out really well, but the the maps that I had on ITD didn't work well for like uh, secure unexplored rooms and stuff like mm-hmm. that. 
Um, and some of the tech ops for uh, novitiates are like stand on a point and then stand on the point later. So yeah. if you get a point close enough to center and center line, you can like stand on the point, be close to the center and capture it um, and get like three of them together. So it can be be pretty useful. I, I like security for them. I think that like security needs some work. I'm not a huge fan of like secure center line because it's like a little finicky. Like where is the center line sometimes? But you know, it it's okay. Um, give me seek and destroy with them though. That's what I really want. Yeah, it's funny that security has basically <laughs> three places where you can get the rules for it. You can get the tech up deck. You got to look at the approved ops hazardous areas and then you also have to look at the in the dark one because there's little changes to security kind of like littered throughout the the rule books so for anyone who doesn't know go to warhammer community go to the downloads page and then go ahead and download all three of the different ways that you can go grab secure center line and i think on in the dark the weird part is that open doors are part of the center line even though the walls that are touching the center line are not so it's a very odd ruling I mean, it, it makes sense. That's it. Like it works, and it, that's the only part of the center line on those walls that you can cross. But it's just odd that that's how all of that stuff works. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's just weird. Um, I think it should be like a, a big line. Like you know, give it a size through the board. I think the issue on in the dark is you want to make sure that people actually fight each other, and if the door is not open, that's not going to happen. So it's just mm-hmm. a way to make sure that people are not playing like cowards and hiding in a room. Yeah, that makes sense. What was your biggest in the dark surprise? You know, you haven't played it all that much over the last year because you get are the TO of the Pacific Northwest scene, so you get to dictate yep. whether or not it's going to get played a ton. So yep. you probably had a couple things that were probably surprises for our listeners who don't play a lot of in the dark or just want a little bit of a refresher on what some of the spices. What did you get caught out unawares about this weekend? You know, I, I'm like pretty good with the rules on Into the Dark for the most part. Um, sometimes like. Yeah, I think like remembering that I could move up to the door and open it while I'm on conceal and then hatchway fight with someone is like really the thing that like clicked for me um, and kind of like was like, OK, there's maybe there's a little bit more to this than I, I was thinking. You know, maybe I should inspect uh, ITD a little bit deeper. Um, you know, I I don't think I like really got caught. I made mistakes mostly like with how I use my action economy on Into the Dark, because it's definitely different. Um, Having to manage opening doors for an APL is is difficult for my my little brain um, coming from open. And, like, it it really restructures, like, the order of activation. And that's, I think, where I got caught up, um, is, like, figuring out how I need to activate my guys because like the way that fighting works is slightly different in the hatchways um, guard kind of throws stuff off a little bit. Um, it just like those little stuff, like the nuance caught me, you know? Yeah. I think the nuance of in the dark is probably some of the fun stuff for listeners. who don't know. One of the big things that I try to remind people of is that you can open doors while moving. And this is a really big spot for breaking guard windows. Because guard is the new action on In the Dark, and it happens at the end of every action. And when you are opening a door, you can do it in the middle of a normal move or a dash, which means that you can actually move one inch, get within range of a door, open it, be fully out of line of sight of your opponent, and then finish your move somewhere else. And that can really trip people up. See, I didn't even know that, like, till just now. So, you're teaching me things. Like... Um, it, it, like I said, it's still the nuance. Like, I know that you could like move through a door and open it, but like move kind of up to it and finish outside. Never thought of it that way. I don't think that's ever like come up to be a question someone's asked me, you know? Yeah. And then when it comes to people guarding, it's, it's really, really easy in most cases to just be able to set up a non reciprocal shot. So you can just shoot the model that's guarding while avoiding their guard anyways, which is like annoyingly easy. And then if someone ignores obscuring, it's even easier. Yeah. The way that you counterplay that as a proactive step is instead of trying to take guards in the middle of when, like in the middle of rooms, you run over into like weird corners and rooms where the only way your opponent can see you is if they walk fully into a room. 
And that's probably the way that you break those sorts of guard windows. Because if you're just hanging out in the middle of the room, it's very easy to spot you from the outside of the room. But if you're hanging on the edge of a wall, you might not have as much cover, but your opponent sure as heck is not going to be able to see you unless he's inside the room with you and taking that guard window. One of the things I did is I stuck my condemner like in the very corner where there was like the with a barricade in front of him, you know, and he's going to sit on conceal. But like um, it, eventually I moved him out a little bit to get a shot on someone. But like because of the angle where he was at, it was almost impossible um, in that very, very deep corner for someone to get an angle without coming out enough in the doorway to expose themselves and may take a shot at them um, if I went on guard or something like that, um, which I did a few times like just because it was more useful for me to put pressure on that doorway than just to leave him on conceal sitting there doing nothing. Yeah, a small tip for anyone getting a little bit frustrated with in the dark, that is a way that you can basically set up safe guard windows. You might not be able to touch a point, but if you can force your opponent to at least get shot first, you're not going to lose tempo when you go do it. And tempo and like momentum is so important in this game. I think it's like a really under focused point for a lot of players who are kind of getting stuck in a single spot um like in their competitive play like they feel like they're not progressing they they don't like really learn like um about keeping that tempo and that momentum going with it in the game um and kind of like building your plays off and trying to throw your opponent off by maybe doing something a little off kilter a little uh, different than they would expect yeah it really seems like most of the opinions out there are that like kill team should be like a uh, a slow tempo kind of like patient game and a lot of like players a lot of players have had good success with that um but i've just been like 100% on the train of the opposite and uh you know i'm not like winning gts mm-hmm. or anything but uh it definitely is the way to play elites that's for sure yeah i i am a notoriously aggressive player um i'm probably like the most aggressive player in the pacific northwest generally um and like it it's one of those things like i'm going to be putting pressure on you turning point one if i see like a sliver of opportunity i will kill someone maybe two people um with elites or or any team um you know i'm coming out early turning point two you're going to be fighting me. You're not going to be able to take points. You're not going to be able to complete your objectives. Um, yeah. And then you know, like even the players on, trying it's, it's, to slow down, they can't cause you're just, you're right there. Yeah, exactly. Um, I played a game yesterday against Tristan, um, who was up at the, the GT planning, playing salvagers. And I was playing nemesis claw into his salvagers. And it was one of the weirdest games. I think we ever played. Um, I think we finished with like at eight, primaries and he had six something like that and it was just um we both had like one person left at the end of it uh there's one turning point where like only a single tack off was like only a single victory point was scored um you know just like absolute insane pressure from both of us and it was just a really cool unique game like i've never played yeah i mean ultra violence definitely has its place in the game and can be a good tempo swing. You mentioned a little bit about tempo. For players who don't know, tempo is this concept that's used in Magic or chess or something else to basically say who's dictating the flow of the game, who's the aggressor, who's the defender, and who has basically the ability to dictate what is going to happen. So you mentioned that there's a little bit of a tempo flow for Novitiates or even for Legionary or Space Marines. I think that Jason here has talked about how his tempo when he's playing for Marines is to run up and basically be aggressive and put the onus on your opponent. Can you deal with these six 14 wound dudes with three up saves now? Or are they going to be running roughshod all over your lines? How do you manage to do that with novitiates? When are you holding tempo and when are you giving your opponent space to dictate the pace of the game a little bit so that you can get better shots or find some other ways to do stuff? I mean, like, right away, depending on map and stuff like that, I'm either going to be doing um, probably like an infiltrate so I can change my leader's order. I can deploy her pretty aggressively um, in a spot where she's safe Um, or maybe just out in the open and like blinding light and hope that they come out early and try to take a shot at her so I can just run up and switch her order and shoot them. Um, But also the condemner is a key piece for putting that pressure. Um, As we covered earlier, he can be kind of swingy, but he's like... He's threatening 
silent. Um, if you roll good and then you're you're using your axe of faith, he'll kill almost anything by pushing through. Lots of more wounds, you know. And then it's about staging the rest of your threats. There, um, the the penitent is so dangerous; um, it can run so far. Throw that crack grenade, or just chop some people in half. You know, if you get a position right, you're right. You're you're likely going to get two people. Um, the flamers are super solid. Um, depending on map, you can also like put the banner out. Is a good way to kind of disrupt your opponent's tempo and stuff like that. Uh, because the banner, a lot of people don't know because it's not seen a lot, can cause people to shoot on death um, for a four up, which, depending on matchup and map, can be really, really useful because certain objectives are really close and it can get just right there in the right spot to, to hit, you know, three, three people. And so you're really putting down a lot of extra firepower when you know your people are going to die. It's also got eight wounds, which is definitely a weird spot for most opponents. Yeah, I mean, like, they're like, oh, I'm going to kill this one, seven, you're, you're like, actually, this one's got eight, so we're good. Um, it's, like, enough to throw off breakpoints. Um, novitiates with eight wounds would be interesting. I think the Reliquarius is also an underutilized piece when it talk when we talk about things that let you break parity, right? It might not be reliable, because for anyone who doesn't know, the Reliquarius has the Icon Bearer equivalent for Novitiates. She's got eight wounds, but she's got the Icon of Purity, which is whenever a friendly Novitiate is incapacitated within six inches of her, you can slam the staff, and on a four-up, that operative can immediately perform a shoot action, which means that you're not really great into melee operatives, so Commando, Scouts, and some of these other stat checks might not be the best, but against something like Brood Brothers or Wormblade, who really want to get into shootout, getting a Reliquarius just within range can definitely allow you to take some more aggressive lines, really letting you dictate the pace of where your operas are going to go. Like having some flamers at the end of turn one run proactively onto some objectives with a Reliquarius behind them means that depending on where you get your Defenders of Faith, you might be able to get two or three shots off a model, which is definitely not something that most players are really going to want or allow. Yeah, um, it like gets really nasty, like it, especially if you get the flamer for Defenders of Faith in the right spot, uh, and then you're you're using the flamer, and then it's dying, and it's been buffed for all three of them. Like that's a lot of dead models, um, especially like if you have initiative and stuff like that. They're probably not positioned to to be able to deal with someone that can move around that much and deal that much damage. Yeah, because for players who don't know, the Burning Wrath that lets you turn your Pregatus's Flamer up a damage profile lets you do it until the end of the turning point. So on the off chance that you do get to line it up and there's enough targets because you've baited your opponents out, you can just Burning Wrath the way through your entire opponent's lines. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I did that to an opponent at Tacoma. Um, you know, I kind of baited him over to one side and... They thought they had me. Um, I took some like hard losses early on, but it was like mostly my chaff. And then my my Pergatus ran up behind them and killed four of their guys um, in one activation. You know, like there there was nothing they could do about it. Yeah. So kind of in general, is that typically the main sort of flow? Like their main role is that like the once the enemies come out to address your other threats, the per- the Pergatus are like the main counter punch sort of role um i think so like it's either like they're the counter punch um on it or depending like if they've made a mistake um because of their mobility like they can definitely get out there and like push that damage through um you yeah. know it's it's a team you have to capital like the game is all about capitalizing on your opponent's mistakes but like especially if you're outnumbered um you need to be trading up on models um if you're not they're gonna overwhelm you um, you know, regular guardsman is a threat to a novitiate if they're within, you know, the right ranges and they have the right equipment or or whatever. Like, there's nothing you can do against, like, any of the blooded models charges you. Like, you're dead. Like, it's not going to happen. Um, you're not going to fight your way out of it unless you have one of your two melee guys on the team or your leader, you know? So, it's, like, really about keeping those, like, mid-range threats, um keeping them safe like because like once you're on engage for defenders of the faith um you can't like you can't blinding light you know they're they're free game so i think like unless it's into the dark you're really going to be try to push that turning point three stuff like that um you know use it when your leaders 
moving up to like add additional plasma to the round. Um, that's another thing. Like with the the staff, like you know, the leader could can be shooting a whole lot uh, on there. Like p- potentially defenders of faith, and you think you got them. Medics picking them up. They're moving. They're shooting again. You know, like it gets pretty nasty. Yeah. Another example of the novitiate's auras. Yeah. Uh, and like defenders with, of the faith with the plasma pistol is like an elite's ultimate nightmare. Uh, Cause like you out activate them, then you could run up, kill, shoot, like kill a whole like intercessor, for example. Um, and if you don't die to shoot on death, which is pretty often, you're probably fine there. Uh, then defenders of the faith do it again. And uh, it's pretty yeah, easy exactly. to just guaranteed kill like two elites there. Yeah. I mean, like it's the best plasma in the game. Like she hits on twos. If you dice fixes, like, um, if you're not rolled ones. Yeah. I mean, like I generally run an icon of faith on her because I think that the, the point, because like she already hits on twos, um, it like comes out to be like a better value there because I'm hitting with most of my shots. If I need to reroll a one, I can do that. And then I can use a free faith, uh, to like turn another one into a crit to push that through if I really need four you know, like that extra crit for some reason. All right. So instead of going with the angle of I'll spend the, I guess nowadays because the auto chastiser costs two points, it's not quite the freebie it used to be. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like we're not in the days of, uh, you know, seven auto chastisers and a crack grenade or like a crack, a frag and five auto chastisers, Um, you know, and then also dice fixing like your rerolls. Like, you're like, oh, I'll, I'll reroll this because auto chastiser and then I'll turn it into a crypt. Um, those were the glory days. Yes, some would call them the glory days. I mean, like, they were definitely, like, problematic um, then, but, like, they were fun, you know, like, oppressive, but fun. <laughs> yeah, they definitely were. I mean, back in the day, their worst matchups were definitely better. So now that their worst matchups have gotten a little bit worse basically speaking mostly about commandos because commandos really were their biggest kryptonite in the past and because commandos basically have never not been a played team at any tournaments you were always going to run into some number of players and if you were playing against anyone who's competent it was always going to be a rough matchup whether or not they were going to be actually a bunch of new players or actually a super skilled commando it was always going to be a rough stat check I've never had an easy game against commandos, like unless the player just had bad dice and horrible positioning. Like um, every time like someone like competent, like at all, any level of competence plays them. It is just like a nightmare of a game for me. I remember at LVO, uh, not this year, but the year before I charged like the grot with my my leader and I whiffed everything and the grot killed me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like my legionary leader, like oh, cha- a sputtering champion, like it was, it was heinous. I did oh. see that actually during one of the games in the upper bracket. There was we were out of time and we were pushing the players to go a little bit faster. And someone had a grot, and they're like, "I'm just going to swing and see what happens." And nothing happened. They're like, "All right, cool, he's dead now." So, in that universe, it, there is a universe where that grot hero moded, and the opposing operative just did nothing and died. So. I guess you got to live the one where you killed something and at Tacoma, someone died. Yep, absolutely. Like, I mean, like, you know, uh, it's a dice game at the end of it. Uh, So, you know, sometimes uh, they frown on you. Yeah, sometimes the dice do not go your way. As far as the local scene in the Pacific Northwest goes, you've got some big tournaments coming up. You want to... Shout them out. I mean, Tacoma seems like a very, pretty busy popping scene. So I know there's some other stuff in the wings. So you want to tell our listeners here, some who might not have, might not know about this. Yeah. Um, so on October 4th, 5th and 6th, uh, we're going to be hosting Kill Scream 3. Um, it's part of our own independent convention. We're launching here soon. Um, it's going to be like really indie. So if you're into like indie tabletop war games and stuff, uh, come out and play some Kill Team and check out all the, the other stuff we got going on. Um, it's going to be three player, 128 tournament. Uh, hopefully it's going to be the biggest event. Uh, that's what we're shooting for, at least. And hopefully the biggest event post you or LVO. Um, after day two. So um, first day, we're going to have one or two rounds. We're still finalizing schedule. Um, and then after the second day, um, we're going to have a cut so that all of the, the top players going for the golden ticket and the giant 
championship uh, wrestling belt that we have up for prize. Um, they can play some narrative games. We'll have a custom narrative uh, kind of setting and stuff like that going on. Or they can play some tournament games or go take some painting classes. Um, we have Dan Osborne who's going to be taking some classes along with a few other people. Um, so that should be really neat. Um, we're going to be giving away like a couple thousand dollars in prizes. I think we're going for like right around five grand in prizes that will be given away. Um, we give away a lot of prizes at our events. Um, if you've ever seen photos from our stuff, it's like a big pile of, of things. Um, and it doesn't only go to people who finish, you know, first in their like bracket or first, you know, at the table, first three. Um, we give out prizes throughout for sportsmanship, stuff like that, painting. Um, we really like enjoy people to get involved um, in different ways and like uh, reward them for coming out and playing. Uh, I feel like they're they're part of something great there. So um, it'll be accessible like via light rail um, because we're having it at the Lloyd Center, which is like kind of like this uh, dead mall here in Portland. It's pretty iconic. Big old ice skating rink out in front of it. Um, we're going to make war on the bones of uh, capitalism, you know, so that should be fun. Um, and it's going to be... be this is the second time I've heard about one of these events being run in the capitalist bones of a mall that once was. I mean, like, it's almost like you hosted one, I think, wasn't it? I ran a tournament at the UTC, which was run in the corpse of a dead mall. I think while we were in the mall, I likened it to a whale fall, which is this biological concept yeah, of uh -huh. when a whale dies in the ocean and its corpse falls to the deep ocean, it becomes basically the hunting ground for the entire ecosystem <laughs> that's very much what it felt like in this dying mall where there is like these martial arts studios that were closed on the weekend which i assume would be not the time that you would be closed <laughs> yeah no absolutely um the lloyd center is like a really interesting place as far as like portland goes it's like it's very portland um the vibe there really good um there's like a whole bunch of like indie stuff that's popped up there there's like a tattoo studio on one end and then like a really cool comic book store and like um uh, i think like this place that like deals in like safubi um which is like a japanese toy uh, for those of you that aren't familiar they're like super cool they're like soft vinyl um i'm obsessed with them i can't afford any of them because they're super expensive um just like all kinds of cool, like artsy, fartsy stuff going on there. Um, and it's just like the perfect place to, to kind of fit in. Um, they've been great to work with the Lloyd Center. Um, and we're, we're happy to host it there. Um, we do have also, uh, discounted rooms available for people who are interested in coming out, um, at the Hilton that's right across the street. So you can stay, um, for pretty cheap and then just like walk straight to the convention. You can walk to the rails write it all over, eat the best pizza in the United States. Um, oh! <laughs> hey, it's like, it's, it's a fact, like, food places have written about it. Portland is pizza capital of the USA. Um, and I'm putting those fighting words out there, so people listening, come out here and eat the pizza and then challenge me about it. So, um, unless you're coming to Kill Scream 3 or CritCon, um, the larger event, uh, you, can't, you can't say nothing uh, until you come out here and eat our pizza. I feel like now we're going to have pizza on the uh, cover art for the episode. I mean, like, yeah, hell yeah. What's your favorite kind of pizza, guys? Oh, uh, I'm partial to like sausage and peppers, but I have no idea what the name of that pizza is. It's just something I like. I, I think it's sausage and peppers, like green peppers. Uh, Yeah, something spicy, something, you know, that has a little bit of heat. Okay. What day is Kill Scream? Uh, it's October 4th, 5th and 6th. So three days. Um. First day is going to be like a little bit lighter uh, as far as rounds go and then let people kind of get in, experience stuff, um, check out the con. And then um, day two will be three, three rounds um, again, ending early so that people can like experience the city. We really want people to like come out and like experience how wonderful the Northwest is. Uh, despite what some news channels will tell you, Portland has not burned to the ground. Um, the weather out here is lovely. The city's lovely. Incredible food, incredible art, uh, great music, um, stuff like that. And then Sunday will be, like I said, last day. We're going to have one to two rounds and just like, or sorry, two to three rounds and then wrap up our day and let people go home. Um, 
we're also working with a, a local res wrestling group and we're doing we're co -do sponsoring a wrestling tournament um that's going on the first night so people will be able to buy tickets with discounted kill scream ticket with a a bundled in uh wrestling ticket for a, a nice little price so yeah it sounds like a actually a really cool event what seems very well thought out it'll be the third one correct yeah third kill scream our first uh crit con and crit con is like the, the cascadia regional independent tabletop convention um it's our own little little thing um we were kind of gifted with this space at the the lloyd center for um you know by them not for free but um we have space to be able to provide other events and other organizers um the ability to come in and show off their stuff and support our community uh so that's what we want to do and it's going to be really fun yeah that'll be the beginning of october and for anyone interested in actually coming to the new york open we will be at the end of october october 26 27 we have tickets up so for anyone who's interested in having an excuse to come to new york and playing some competitive kill team or some narrative kill team or BattleTech or necromunda or 40k now's the time tickets will be up in the show notes so october is gonna be a busy month for kill team and kind of both of our respective scenes yeah uh, i'm gonna i'm really trying to like depending on how october goes i'm gonna try to make it out there and maybe uh maybe sell some shirts at your event so we'll see yeah yeah are there any other big tacoma things that you want to shout out before we split uh no i just want to shout out my community at large kill team cascadia um you can check out uh, our. You can buy tickets to Kill Scream right now at CascadiaTabletop.com. Um, that website will be getting updated here soon with full convention information, a tour guide to Portland, stuff like that. Uh, right now, and then uh, check out the shirts that I make at DiceThrower.BigCartel.com. And you guys have started a podcast since the last time well, you were on here, right? You're, you're right. I guess I should shut out my podcast. We are uh, on Vox Cascadia. Um, we are less serious than a lot of the other ones. I think we're slightly more serious than, uh, like the kill team casuals, but less serious than everyone else. So, yeah, we've got a large independent ring of podcasts running about the world, spreading the mm -hmm. joy of kill team. And the game has been growing in leaps it's, and bounds. So it's so good. If you're not playing kill team and you're listening to this, first off, what are you doing? Um, go get some minis. Uh, that's weird that you don't have minis and you're not playing kill team. Um, if you don't have a community to play kill team, start one because it's not as hard as you think it is. And it's fun. Yeah, because I think when we had started this way back and we interviewed you, it was a much smaller community and it has become much larger. And it all started with one small tournament, just like it did in New York. So for anyone listening who's thinking, hey, there's really not enough people, you never know. And there, there's a ton of people. There's like people that want to play, get get people out of their store, discords or Facebook groups and into your group and organize them into a community. It's It's truly not hard. Go have fun. Play some tabletop games. Maybe raise some money for charity too. It's easy. You can bully nerds into doing that. You just be like, we're we're raising money for this uh the shelter down here. And people are like, hell yeah. Sweet. Well thanks for coming on and thank you listeners for listening until the end.